but it's great to have a good turnout for what I consider the most important meeting that the Southland farmers have had to, or need to know about, in fact the whole community need to know about for some time, because we've had 20 years of um, being browbeaten about a subject that uh, hopefully we're going to shed some light on tonight. So my name's Don Nicholson, uh, for my sins I've spent about 25 years puddling around in this space, and at the Federated Farmers level I was sure that we were going to beat this and get some common sense back into the narrative in the mainstream um, media, let alone the politicians. But in 2023, we still haven't got there. And so, before I start this evening, I want to put a big shout out to Mike from uh, What's On Invis for filming this event. Um, he's kindly turned up tonight and um, we really appreciate it. But, and on top of that, the most appreciation, to be fair, needs to go to Dr. Jock Allison for his effort coordinating tonight and getting Tom from America, um, keep coordinating with others and, and Groundswell, and I see Laurie's here, um, to make this happen. Uh, Tom's done quite a few events around the country already and he's in the last 48 hours of his, of his tour. So I've said that I, um, I've spent 20 years doing this sort of stuff and there was a lot of events in that 20 years that uh, really have, if I'd known about them 20 years ago, we may not have to be, we wouldn't have had to be here tonight. One is, for instance, the man hockey stick. How dishonest that was founded. There's been other key events, like knowing that some of the AR reports from the drafters of the original reports of the IPCC to the IPCC in the 90s were doctored and uh, altered before uh, they made the final copy. And it wasn't until some years later that some of that was outed. And we learned that um, the modelling, in recent years we've learned that the modelling that the IPCC input, is, input was predominantly um, done with gases in isolation, each gas in isolation, not in a real atmosphere. So in a dry atmosphere, um, nothing real about it. None of the IPCC models have ever worked in terms of the reality of global warming, if there is something to be, to be worried about. The tipping points have never happened. As Jasper and I said on our show today, uh, Greta had a scientist, uh, tweeted a scientist in 2019 had said, 2018 had said that uh, we'd be feeling the pressure because um, we'd overuse fossil fuels and in 2023 would pretty much be in terminal mode. I think we're all pretty happy here tonight, I hope. Um, there's lots of other things. Things have never materialised. There's been so much dishonesty. Aided in recent years by the Public Interest Journalism Fund, you'll find that not one column inch has been given to Tom in his first week of touring here. Not one column inch. We're, we've got a disgraceful MSM. MSM. Um, but on top of all that, and as Tom's going to perhaps show you um, more clearly than I can explain, um, the recent admission by the IPCC that methane's effect and the 100 year methane effect has been overstated by a factor of three or four hasn't even made headlines. Last year, the representation concentration pathways that all our engineers and councils and everyone are using to sort of build the future resilience uh, in this country uh, talked about 8.5 being the most extreme um, end, but that's what we were modelling toward. Well, I've been told that you should look, it's so unlikely by the IC IPCC, that they should look at 2.6 to 4.5. Um, so basically nothing to see here, no need to get all loud in a sweat and loud up about. So before I introduce Tom, I just want to say some other points. Um, we know about steady, we know about the methane cycle. Farmers know about it. School children know about it. We know about the CO2 um, in the atmosphere. We know about steady state stocking rate. We know that about production leakage um, if we go down this track of taxing um, New Zealand livestock. We know, no, your number is a joke. We don't need to do it. 
if everything was put up front and honest and honestly presented. So with all that knowledge, why hasn't there been any political movement to take the heat off the farming sector of this country that has been so vilified for 20 to 25 years on this matter? And so Tom's going to show you why. There is no need. Just say no, to use the groundswell um, narrative. Just say no. And so with that, with that in mind, and clearly showing my bias, um, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, Dr. Uh, Tom Sheehan. And yeah, give him a round of applause. He's coming. <laughs> and before I turn on his microphone so he can't interrupt me, <laughs> um, Tom has a BSc and PhD in de degrees in physics from the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, often known as MIT, and is a well known science presenter on climate issues. He is president of the Science and Environment Policy Project, SEPP, and president and CEO of Western Technology Incorporated, an independent consulting firm specialising in energy technology issues uh, with business implications. And Tom will dispel any uh, rumours that he is in the pay of big oil tonight. Uh, and so it's with that. Would you welcome Tom to the podium? He's got about a 45 minute to a one hour presentation and I'm sure you will be riveted for the, in, in, for the duration. I'll switch him on. <laughs> okay, yeah, sounds like it works. It does. Great, great, great. Thanks very much, Don. It's a real pleasure to be here with you folks down here at the, uh, um, the bottom, the south, the extreme of uh, New Zealand. I've never been this far south before, and um, I love it. it. We're outside, a little drills, a little rain here and there, but it's been really very nice. We got to talking about the, uh, the world of um, hunting, which takes place here. Apparently, wild deer can be shot any time by you folks. In our country, we have this season business. So bow and arrow season starts about September and runs all the way to March. Uh, muzzle loader season takes up almost the whole month of November. Okay. Is that louder? Whatever. Is that up? Not me. I don't know. I can't see it. No, I can't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What the hell is up? Well, I, it sounds to me, I don't know, do I hear an echo from the from the room? Or from the uh, speakers? Maybe not. I turned you down? Yeah. Okay, so I need to do, is it that? Is that turning you up? Uh, let's see if I talk in the my lapel mic. At, uh, is it be able to hear pretty well? Down. Is this better for people? No? No? Oh, God. He's one of that. What do you want? Yeah, up. Oh, wrong thing. He's turning it up over there. Oh, over there. Okay. Yeah, all right. Great. Okay. Not so blind after all. So anyway, so in our country you have these seasons where bow and arrow runs from September to March, muzzle loader, you get the whole month of November, and gun season is only two weeks in the early December, which in our part of the country is the lousiest weather of the year, freezing rain, stuff like that. Well, I happen to be very skilled, and I've bagged over my career seven total deer. <laughs> and my weapon of choice in all cases was a Toyota. <laughs> and moreover, Toyota season is 24-7-365. <laughs> anyway, um, so you've seen the title. What I'm going to talk about now is the um, uh, two parts, really. The work of my colleagues in America, actually Van Weingarten, William Van Weingarten is from York, Canada, Ontario, Ontario, Canada. 
Uh, Will Happer, a very eminent scientist, is from Princeton University in New Jersey. And what they did was a calculation of such spectacular accomplishment that the only thing you can say, it, say about it is they got it right. And that counts for a lot in the world of science, and I'll explain why. They, there is satellite data, and the satellite data tells you what's going on as far as radiation rising from the Earth goes. They calculated, and they got agreement with data. And that is what we call the scientific method, because in science you have to have data come first, and theory has got to agree with data. And if they don't agree, go fix your theory, but don't pretend the data isn't there. Well, when you have a calculational method that works and gets you agreement with measurement, then you've got a valid model, and when you have a valid model, you can start doing tests and variations with it that allow you to find out other con considerations. In other words, a valid model enables you to do calculations that you can trust, you can depend on. The second part of my talk, which is a shorter part towards the latter, uh, latter part, is to explain why a certain magical number called global warming potential are meaningless, null and void, useless, etc. They come from over, oversimplified uh, concepts, uh, incorrect assumptions, and uh, uh, inferior, wrong, mistaken application of uh, really just very simple arithmetic, actually. So we'll go on. The bottom line of all that I have to say tonight is this. The three major policies that are pending, not only in uh, New Zealand, but elsewhere, tighter regulations, taxes on ruminants, and higher costs imposed on farmers. And every one of those are completely pointless and unnecessary. And as farmers, you should feel strong enough not to be intimidated to be able to stand up against the people who claim it's necessary to tax ruminants, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I've got to tell you a little bit about a couple of key concepts that you need to understand within this. The first term of, that will be unfamiliar to you is the word forcing, and it means radiation moving in a certain direction. Um, sunlight moves towards the Earth, Radiation from the Earth goes off into space. Forcing refers to the motion of that radiation, and it's usually measured in watts per square centimeter. All day long, the sun pours 340 watts per square meter onto you, but about 100 watts per square meter is bounced back into space, and um, about, well, 239 watts per meter get through to the Earth and reach the uh, atmosphere or the surface, which remember is 71% water. Um, of course, in the southern heaven, hemisphere, it's about 80% water, but at any rate, a um, lot gets through. And now it has to be disposed of. And at night, the Earth radiates energy away. And it does it in a number of different ways, but 239 is the magic number that has to be emitted. And that has to leave to get into space in order for the Earth to stay in equilibrium, because otherwise you'd have a, the planet would be getting warmer if it just had day after day increased sunlight. So here's a little picture that shows you what's going on. The yellow arrow coming in down from the sun, um, we see little arrows branching off from it with a light uh, sunlight that gets never makes it to the ground. There's even some of it that is reflected right off the surface. But more or less, about 51% of the energy actually is absorbed by the oceans. And that's what the radiation outgoing has to work on. Um, and that's what these little sort of maroon arrows are over at the right. Uh, far right, there's a little energy that actually goes right through the infrared without ever being caught, trapped, or interrupted at all. But uh, other energy le leaves the surface, not by radiation at all, but because the ocean evaporates, and that evaporated water in the air drifts up through convection to the high, and high altitudes where it forms clouds, and that energy is called latent energy, and it's dropped off at the higher altitudes. 
So you've got all these mechanisms for, by which energy in the Earth goes out and leaves. But finally, for the whole planet as a system, with the atmosphere on top of it, and the stratosphere, and the mesosphere, ultimately, the exit of energy from the planet has to be by radiation into space. So I, I do this now to, so that you're comfortable with some of these concepts, which might seem to go by pretty fast later on. A molecule, if it's made of two atoms, as in oxygen, O2, nitrogen, N2, all it can do is vibrate back and forth like this. But when a molecule is made of three atoms, like CO2, it can twist and turn this way, that way, that way, all, all kinds of different vibration modes, okay? And when it does so, that same molecule is also rotating around at various speeds. So what you have is energy levels that appear in what are called vibration rotation bands. Every energy state is quantized and it has to be an exact amount. But these exact amounts are very, very close together. So when you are looking at light uh, coming away in radiation, it appears in what's known as a band. And each band has a center and the band also has wings. In a few more slides, you'll see the difference between center and wings. What happens is the states, the vibration rotation states in the center fill up first and later on the band, the states out in the wings. And we call this sequence of filling up saturation. Imagine rubbing a dry sponge on a wet floor, you pick up a lot of water. By the time your sponge gets soaked and squishy, it doesn't pick up any more water. Saturation. Here's how saturation looks like for a gas in the air. This one is for carbon dioxide, but all of the greenhouse gases have a shape of the same general idea. At first, let's see if I have some, there's my little laser pointer, but just a little bit of concentration. Remember out here is the parts per million the concentration, okay? 1% by the way is way over there somewhere. But when you have just a little bit, it absorbs a lot of the radiation. And pretty soon at 20 parts per million already, some of your um, um, energy has uh, been absorbed. And it looks like about 80% is gone in the first 20 parts per million. Go to 40 parts per million, more, 85. 60 parts per million, maybe 88, 80, 90%, 91, 92, 93, etc. We're out here at 420 nowadays for carbon dioxide. And the point of this slide is to show you that saturation has set in and there isn't very much energy more that can be absorbed. So if you take away a little carbon dioxide or you, if you bring a little carbon dioxide back, Either way, it's not going to make any difference at all. And the reason is CO2 has reached the state called saturation. H2O has a curve that's more or less the same shape as this. And H2O is out at 1.5% more or less. Remember, humidity, humidity swings around all day long. Humidity is all over the place. So whether it's 1%, 2%, a half a percent, or 4%, there's a variation depending on humidity. But it's out at 1.5%, roughly, which is 15,000 parts per million. So that's so far off the chart on the extreme right that you can't hardly find it. And guess what's happened to the absorption? It's way, way, way down there. Absolutely no change at all, which is why Nothing changes in the weather or the climate depending on whether there was high humidity one day or not. So all of the gases, including ozone, methane, nitrous oxide, have a shape of a curve like this. So here's what happens to the greenhouse effect. You have the Earth that emits heat radiation, and as I said, there are these bands, okay? Uh, but the Earth itself radiates sort of uniformly and we call the Earth's radiation black body radiation. The atmosphere absorbs and emits some of that radiation, which slows down the cooling rate at night. 
You've often heard the word trapped. No, it's not trapped. It's just sort of slowed down. It's like bumps in the road. All night long, the Earth is cooling and radiation is leaving and escaping into space. And then the next morning, the sun comes up and the whole thing starts all over again. If there were no atmosphere at all, the radiation from the surface would leave immediately to space and it would be a whole lot cooler. About uh, 33 degrees C cooler, which in at, uh, absolute temperature means about 255. Well, whatever radiation is escaping, it will be less than that maximum that the surface of the Earth emits, the black body emission. And a greenhouse effect is the difference between those two. The best way to think about this is by looking at a graph. And we're going to do that shortly. Now, here's what's happened in recent years. William Van Weingarten, York University, Will Happer, Princeton University, did a paper that is stunning in its accomplishment. Way back in 1919 or so, a guy named Schwarzschild wrote a textbook. And in there is a whole bunch of uh, equations. And in principle, you can kind of do this, but nobody possibly could because there are so many different bands and states and energy, this, that. The calculation was impossible. But they did it because of their advances in modern computer technology. What they did was they calculated all the radiation coming and going, absorbing and emitting from all the greenhouse gases. And they got the intensity of the spectral lines all across the entire infrared region. An incredibly important essential point that I really can hardly emphasize enough is that their model atmosphere was real air. Well, many of you are thinking, well, of course air is real. <laughs> no, what I'm talking about is the difference between a laboratory gas known by the name of dry air and the real atmosphere that you have to deal with. In a laboratory experiment, if you want to do something uh, with oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc., you really want the incoming gas to be clean and free of H2O because it messes up your experiment. So, big pipe comes in with air. You put this little uh, beads of fuzzy stuff called desiccants in the way. And as it drifts by, the water all lands on the desiccants. And at the end of the pipe, you've got air that contains no H2O. And that's dry air. And it's ideal for a laboratory experiment. But it isn't the right stuff for the real atmosphere because H2O is very important. The U.S. standard atmosphere, that's because it was thought up by U.S. scientists, but it's really the standard atmosphere for the whole world, is uh, an artificial gas that doesn't really exist in the real world. It's great for doing laboratory experiments, and you can make it in your own laboratory if you want to, but it is not the real world. And everything the IPC has been doing for 40 years has pretended that air was dry air. And as I say here, it's an enduring flaw. At the very outset of the first few molecules, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, etc., are all kind of about the same. Even water is the same at about the first few level. They're a factor of two, they, some absorb a little better, factor of five, something like that, but not much difference. Um, the uh, carbon dioxide is just a little stronger than uh, methane on a one at a time molecule basis. The frequencies, the energy of the bands, they're all different, they're all over the place. But the per molecule comparison, well, they're kind of about equal. That isn't what we have to deal with with real air. They calculated the real atmosphere. It hasn't been done before. The IPC, whether they didn't have the computing power or the smart programmers or whatever, it was too tough a problem. But they did it. The dominant greenhouse gas is water. That dominates everything, including the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide is secretary, secondary, and water accounts for about 75% of the greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide for about one quarter, 25% of it. There is a role for ozone. Small, puts a little notch in the greenhouse effect data, 
Ozone is desirable because up in the stratosphere it takes out ultraviolet and keeps us all from getting sunburned all the time. Methane and nitrous oxide, another gas of interest in dealing with uh, ruminant animals, absolutely vanish. Their role is so tiny you can barely find it. And I'm going to show you how uh, extremely difficult it is to find those. You'll be stunned. So the accomplishment is they got it right. They did a calculation that was much too tough to ever be done before, but their computer model was good enough to do it. And in the abstract of their paper, they used the rather reserved scientific term, exceptionally good quantitative agreement with satellite observations. That is, satellite observations are what you see when you're looking down from above. So here goes their data. On the right, is the data that's real. That's what the satellites see. On the left is their computational model. The top pair, left to right, is, um, uh, what do we do here? There we go. Uh, their calculation and the actual data looking down from above the Sahara Desert. The middle pair comes roughly in the yeah, sort of middle European, kind of Mediterranean, whatever. And the difference between the Sahara and the uh, middle of the uh, uh, average places in Europe or whatever is basically just there's a whole lot more water in the atmosphere. And the bottom one is comparing Antarctica calculations on the left, data on the right. Study those for just a minute. See if you can find any difference between the left and the right in any of those groupings. That's what they gener uh, courteously and delicately called exceptionally good quantitative agreement. This is the best agreement I've ever seen in any experiment that I've ever looked at between theory and experiment. This is really, really good. They matched it perfectly across the line in all of these. Their precision of their calculations just isn't matched by any other thing that I know of and certainly not by anything that has been done with regard to climate science before. So, what we can say about this is that they have, um, my little pointer seems to be jumping around here regularly. Uh, okay. So we're here someplace. I gotta make this. I got to make the slide advance, and it's giving me a hard time here. Um, all right, over here with this. Um, um, this really has me befuddled because when we practiced it before, it was all perfect. That always happens to you. Yeah. Um, that's there. Now, I want to get this guy out of the way, basically. Yeah, good. All right, now. I should be able to come over here. Oh, the hell can I do this? Um, I got to get the arrow over here. The, the, well, on my screen, there's a little extra here that I'm trying to show, and I am really befuddled as to why my pointer has completely vanished. There we go. All right. What is science? Theory that agrees with measurement. And when you have a computation, a theory, that gives you the kind of agreement you've just seen, that's the correct use of the scientific method. That's what scientists have been trying to do for a thousand years, from the springing up of science in the Renaissance period to today, making, finding an agreement between theory and measurement is the key to everything. Well, because this agreement is so good, therefore, at last we have a computational method that is trustworthy. For 40 years, nobody has uh, believed that the IPCC models are 
trustworthy because they never agree with measurement. So we've got it, though, now. And as a result, you can now conduct what we call numerical experiments where, on your computer, you vary things around. You can take out the carbon dioxide, you can put in double the carbon dioxide. You can take out methane, you can put in more. You can do all these things, and your computer will grind out a certain result. And thus, because you've got a model that agrees with experiment, you can trust the result. And in particular, we don't have to rely on some of the numbers that the IPCC has constructed such as this magic number known as global warming potential. So, oh, come on. Um, hello. Let me over here now. I'm having a little trouble with this thing. Um, honestly, we did this before and it worked, okay? But I think I can see something else I can do. Okay, here's the comparison in the case of CO2. The curve comes up from the left, kind of, there's a light blue curve that's a little hard to see probably, up there way at the top. That's what the Earth itself gives off. That's what we've called black body radiation. What we really see is this black line. That's, and the difference between the black line and the little blue line is the greenhouse effect. And when you take out CO2, you pretend there is no CO2, then instead of getting this big ditch here, you get this green line. So I got a close-up of it that I think might be able to see a little better. That one's pretty good. Okay. Now the light blue area is the whole greenhouse effect. The black line is today's reality. At low frequencies, that means over here, H2O is taking out a lot of the radiation, and we have a curve that's substantially below the original black body curve. In here, in the real thing, the black line, carbon dioxide is taking out a great big chunk. This deep, deep ditch is due to absorption of carbon dioxide. Over here, you have what's called a window where nothing absorbs. The infrared radiation goes right out to free space at those particular frequencies. Here's a space where oxygen takes something out. A little later on, higher frequencies, H2O resumes its absorption so that what goes out is this little tiny bit down here. When you take CO2 out computationally, you get the green line that is across here. Clearly, you've changed the greenhouse effect by a substantial amount, about 25%. Now, almost invisible is what happens when you double the CO2. Then you get the red line. Can you see it? Look real hard in the ditch created by CO2. A little bit here, a little bit down there, a little bit over here. The center of the band is filled. The wings of the band are filling up a little bit. That's it. That's the effect of doubling CO2, which for 40 years we have been told is a major disaster that will come upon us soon. Um, friends, it isn't important. Now, it may interest you to know that methane and nitrous oxide do absorb radiation over in a little area here. And now I can't get my pointer to go back on. Right. Long about here. It's out in the middle of this region where water is already absorbing a lot of radiation, but both N2O and CH4, nitrous oxide and methane, do absorb in that particular area. So we studied that too. And I remind you once again of this slide that you've seen before. Every one of these gases has a curve that is shaped somewhat like this, although with different values on both axes. Most of the radiation that gets absorbed happens right away in the first little dribble of it. Now let's see what happens with the methane comparison. Okay. Here's the curve you just looked at. And now we have taken the trouble to put in a green line 
for zero methane. We have taken the trouble to put in a red line for double the methane. Can you see it? Okay? We've got a close-up. There's a green line, and the red line is somewhere down there associated with the black line. That's how much the greenhouse effect changes if you either eliminate methane or double methane. Either way, that's what methane does, and all the ruminant animals in the world are going to make less difference than that. Here is a super close-up of that narrow region, and now you can clearly see the green line. So it's about one-tenth of one percent, maybe, if you take away all methane. That's the green line. If you double the methane, maybe a few of you with good eyesight can see a little difference between the red line and the black line. Here, a little bit here, here, here. That's it. That's what doubling methane come, gets you. This is a good physics calculation. This is what Van Weingarten Happer have given to all of us. This is an understanding of the way radiation really works. And that's what the message is. Let's go on now. If CO2 were zero, it would make a very substantial difference in the greenhouse effect, about 25%. That big ditch in the spectrum you saw would vanish, wouldn't be there anymore. The Earth would be cooler as a result. If CO2 were doubled, it would make only a very small difference, those little tiny differences between the red and the black curve on the CO thing. And as for methane and N2O, they're so extremely hard to find on any graph that they don't contribute to the greenhouse effect at all. And with considerable justice, we can call them irrelevant. Remember now, when you have agreement between theory and experiment, theory and measurement, the data, the theory matches the data, that means you're doing good science. And the method of Weingarten Happer met that criteria. The IPCC models for 40 years have never gotten that kind of agreement. They call them general circulation models, they run on great big mainframe computers, and they always predict temperatures that are too high. More CO2 makes only a little difference. More nitrous oxide or methane makes no difference at all. Are you worried about doubling methane? I say, no problem. Go out and buy twice as many sheep. It, that's, I mean, you, you looked at it. You can't find the difference between red and black. Doubling methane is not going to make any difference. There are three reasons why methane is essentially irrelevant. One, there isn't very much in the first place. There's only 1.8 parts per million of methane, where there's 15,000 parts per million of H2O. H2O outclasses it every time, and it absorbs in the same spectral region. That's important, because if there is a photon emitted that's going off in some direction or other, H2O is much more likely to grab it than methane. Oh, and finally, the other point that's important is that there is very little energy emitted by the Earth in the range where methane is able to absorb. So if there's no radiation coming out, there's no radiation to be, radiation to be absorbed. So those are the three strikes against methane. Okay. Um, Here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of the Van Weingart Happer uh, method versus the traditional IPCC thing. You see on the left side the picture you saw before shrunk down to be big enough to see, but the message there is data dominates. The data comes first. The data is what they were able to match. Over on the right side is the tale of the models of all the different labs who are getting paid by the IPC to run a model. And it's a, what we call it is a spaghetti drawing. All those models are zipping down all over the place. And the average of them on a year-by-year -year basis is the sort of yellow-orange dots, okay? And then when you run a straight line through the whole bunch of them, you get the solid red line. Meanwhile, the satellites and the balloons 
are showing you this data down below. There's a right, light green curve for balloons, a dark green curve for um, satellites, and when you run a straight line through them, you get the green line. Notice that the increase in temperature here is about one-third of what the IPCC models are giving you. In other words, they overestimate the temperature by three times, a factor of three. They're way off. But the Van Weingarten and Happer match the data. There's your difference. We can ask, how did this all come about? Here's how the IPC does a report. They have created three working groups. The first is a bunch of scientists, and they examine the science. The second working group asked what was going to happen, what would be the consequences, and group in group three asked what do we ought to do about it. However, despite the good work by these honest people, there is something called the Summary for Policymakers. That is written by diplomats, bureaucrats, etc. People have their own interests. You know, if you're from the country of Gambia, you don't know much about science, but you'd like to get certain advantages. That's the people who write the policymaker. As for the people who read, if you're busy, you haven't got time to read a 1,400-page report. You haven't really got time to read a 75-page summary for policymakers. So you go looking for the summary of the abstract, of the synopsis, of the main points, etc. I once worked in the United States Congress for a year, and I had to give my senator what's called a one-pager on every issue. Get it all down to one page. Fortunately, you can print on both sides of the page, because it is so hard to condense a complicated issue into a tiny space. But that's the way busy people work, parliamentarians, senators, etc. You, you haven't got time to go into the details, and the real science gets buried very deeply. So when working group one says, hey, there's no problem, working group two and three are out of business. They haven't got anything to do anymore. Well, there's a small matter of prestige, money, momentum, and so forth that all make sure that the summary for policymakers keeps telling you there's a problem. And by the way, last October, working group one said about a system of compared models that a certain one of them, which, by the way, was the model that generated all the headlines, was absolutely wrong and shouldn't be used anymore. Do you think that made it into the summary for policymakers? Did they make it into the headline? Did they make it on TV? No. When you say something isn't important, it goes way back on page C63 of the Sunday Supplement, not on page one. And that's what's been going on in the IPCC all these years. And we have Van Weingarten Happer to thank for us moving forward from that. They had certain fundamental errors, and the foremost one was to pretend that the atmosphere was made of dry air. They left out H2O in their initial calculations of the greenhouse effect. All that important difference between the light blue line and the, the, the shaded blue area, they left it all out because they were only concerned with H2O, uh, with, uh, sorry, CH4 and um, CO2. Hey guys, that's not legal. That's not science. But they did. Real air, there's always water and you have to take it into account. And the atmosphere simply doesn't work if you haven't got H2O in there. There'd be no life of any sort without H2O in the atmosphere. H2O is a major greenhouse gas and if you're going to do a calculation, the right way to do science is to do the important one first and then catch the little guys later. They didn't do that. Happer and Van Weingarten did. Another thing they did wrong was having discovered that their models weren't so hot, they tried to patch things up by putting H2 in afterward under the guise of what's called feedback. All weather and climate systems involve feedback. It's really there, and it's important. So what the IPC assumed was called positive feedback, where if the temperature rises, there will be more water evaporates from the ocean, which will cause more greenhouse gases, which will cause rising temperature, and goes around in a circle like that. No. Real feedback 
actually is a negative feedback mechanism that tends to converge because a physical system, when you push it away from its uh, initial or equilibrium point, tends to come back to there. They overlooked that too. So now it's time for part two. That was the story about the whole accomplishment of when Van Weingarten and Happer. There is such a thing as a magic number known as global warming potential, GWP. And it has two cousins known as GWP star and GWP 100, but they suffer from the same difficulty. The idea is they wanted to get a ratio of what's important about this gas compared to CO2, how it compares with that gas against CO2, etc. They had to get numbers that would enable them to sort these gases into levels of importance. This is all described in one of the uh, uh, IPCC reports. When you try to do this, you get a really messy bunch of equations, and so you start making simplifying assumptions. When you don't know some parameter, you say, we've got to get on to this calculation. Call it one, and we'll come back and fix it some other day. The real intent of this kind of stuff is that the reader takes a look at it, gets impressed, skims over it. Now, oh, it's a bunch of integrals on the page. I'm going to turn the page and get something else. And they got this big table, hundreds of gases, of which were methane and N2O were right up there. But they had all these other gases, like this or that type of freon, big table of data, diff different freons are in your auto air conditioner and in your, uh, your home air conditioner, for example, and in your refrigerator. So they got this big table. And there was N2O and CH4 in there, but all the other numbers had the effect on the reader of saying, wow, this is impressive. I better believe it. That's not the way to do things. Here's what the infrared spectrum looks like. We're going here from uh, 600 wave numbers, which is a relatively <coughs> low frequency, up to about 4,000 wave numbers which is a relatively high frequency. And in the way a lot of people have thought about it, over at this end is your low wavelengths, like 2.5 microns. And out here is your high wavelengths, like 25 microns. All right, let's glance across here. Gee, big peak of absorption by methane. Here's an absorption by water. That counts so much. Well, there's something by CO2 here. Uh, more water, big broadband. Water absorbs a lot. Methane comes back again in this space. And look at poor little CO2, not very high. Well, what do you think? It sounds to me, or looks to me, like methane is more important than CO2. Okay? So the ratio would be greater than one, right? Sounds plausible. But now let's look at what's really going on. That dashed red curve shows you where the energy is that comes off the surface of the planet. It's all over at the low frequency end, over to the left. Carbon dioxide is absolutely right close to the peak. And sure enough, carbon dioxide is the dominant one. All this stuff over here, methane and water over here, doesn't make any difference at all because there's no radiation there. No radiation, no energy is coming. There's nothing to absorb. And when you're in this interesting area where there is a methane peak, H2O is absorbing a whole lot in this area. And as I said before, whatever methane is eligible to capture, all those excess water molecules have already captured. So when you put in this uh, input energy, then you see a quite different picture. Once again, the IPCC overlooked it. What you're say basically trying to do is compare two different saturation curves. Okay? Remember, this is what a saturation curve looks like. Right? So we are here at a place where on every saturation curve, the vertical axis is called the absorption. The horizontal axis is the concentration, so many parts per million. When CO2 is, uh, was, uh, when, the, when this graph was made, it was 385. Now it's 420. It doesn't make much difference. But the CO2 absorption is nearly saturated, right? Way out there. Okay, so now we go back to here. 
And the concentration of CH4 at 1.8 parts per million is up there in this little tiny area um, up there uh, at the beginning. Very few parts per million, a very steep curve, notice. CO2 out here has a very flat curve. You are forming the ratio of a steep curve divided by the uh, a slope of a fat curve, uh, flat curve. So, remember your fourth grade arithmetic, you all learned to divide. The quotient is the numerator of the denominator. You also learned that you can't divide by zero. However, you can divide by a number real close to zero. If the denominator is tiny, you're going to have a huge quotient. Take the number three and divide it by two, the answer is one and a half. Take the number three, divide it by two billionths, and your answer is one and a half billion. You have a tiny denominator, you get a huge quotient. When you make a tiny increase of one part per million of CO2, you move from 400 to 401, it makes very little difference. When you change CH4 from 1.8 to 2.8, you get a big change in the saturation curve with a really large slope. That use of arithmetic escapes the attention of the IPCC. And thus, they got values for the so-called GWP, 28 for methane, 315 for nitrous oxide, and for all those freons numbers up in the thousands. Not one of them means a thing. Every single number in the whole GWP series and its cousins is meaningless. The actual spectrum that we saw done by Van Wagner and Happer, that shows the reality and demonstrates the possibility of calculating reality. Uh, went too fast. In the third IPCC report of 2001, they said the long-term prediction of further exact climate states is not possible. That's been an I IPCC statement for over 20 years but it still gets ignored all the time. This is the message that must become clear to elected officials in every government, America, New Zealand, and every place else. And finally, the policy implications are pretty simple. Believe Weingarten and Happer. They're the ones who agreed with, got agreement between theory and, and measurement. They're the ones who followed the scientific method. And don't believe what the IPC summary for policymakers tells you. Don't believe these GWT values. No greenhouse gas is ever going to halt the, uh, and stop the climate from changing. So do not take expensive actions to mitigate climate change. What mankind has done for a million years and what we must continue to do is adapt to climate change because the climate's always going to change. Do not strive to reduce carbon dioxide or any other greenhouse gas. That's a fool's errand. And most important for your concerns here in New Zealand is do not impose new regulations and taxes on farmers. <laughs> so that concludes what I have to say, and I'm happy to talk. I'll answer your questions. Before we uh, get into question time, I just want you to ponder for a moment. Stick it up your mouth. Up the nose or up the mouth? <laughs> um, just talk real loud. Um, why beef and lamb New Zealand? Why dairy and Z? Why more recently federated farmers won't listen to this? Not the payroll, John. Well, we need to just, just ponder it and just decide what your next move is going to be because uh, it is. As a former president of the Gulf of Federation, I'm appalled that the free speech, uh, the learnings that you get from listening and observing, seem to have been put into the, on the back burner to stay in the tent with the government of the day, regardless of the government of the day, actually. And um, 
It's a mystery to me. And Tom Dutton had to get involved in the politics of this. But we've got a big problem. This promise isn't just about farmers. It's about all those service industries. It's about the spending. If you're taxed and the money gets somewhere else, it ain't going to be spent in Southland. And I'm big on Southland sovereignty. So, so secondly, we've got a greenhouse gas consortium. 200 million job, I think, is the number so far that's been spilled into that um, beast. And we're heading to 700 million over the next few years of the, uh, with the new Centre for Climate Change, it's called something else, I've forgotten it. And you won't be aware that last year New Zealand signed into a global uh, green, uh, methane pledge, thanks to Jasper Reed Sleuth, and she found that. None of us knew that. But James Shaw signed us into that last year, where 150 countries are involved in it. So, before we go tonight, and, and we're not going to go yet, don't, don't get me wrong, we need to ponder what your next move's going to be. Groundswell's doing a great job, the others are not. And I'm embarrassed to be, um, was in the company actually of Andrew Hoggard last October or November at the Southern Stadium event, where he got on stage and said that he thinks it's okay that all farmers should pay a little tax, just to get this, off, this monkey off his back. Well, he's now on the act party. Let's just see what he says there. We had a, a farmer at this field days, George Moss from Waikato, say he thinks farmers should pay a small tax just to be doing the right thing. Well, you know, in the end, you've got to say how much of the right thing do you want to do in this economy? And so, hopefully, uh, we're going to get these answers before the end of this because I don't want to leave this function tonight or tomorrow in Gaul or Balclotha without knowledge of what the next move is. You can't just go home and say someone else is going to fix it, because no one has. And I just want to start the questions then with, okay. with that. Tom and I had lunch today and we pondered a few things, but I brought up a few points I wanted to clarify. The first that Hoggart said to me last year is, oh, um, uh, William Dapper and Van Weingarten's papers were published in 2019. Well, I can tell you in 2022 they were. But what is publishing a paper worth today, um, Tom? Is it as worthy? What is peer review? Is it worthy? The peer review problem is severe. Actually, it's worse in the medical research field, uh, where peer review has been very harmful, including some real bad judgment in the, uh, with regard to COVID and its vaccines. When you make mistakes in the medical field, people die. But in the world of climate change, there was a, an event that took place in November of 2009 in which a huge trove of e emails that were meant to keep kept hidden were made public. And in there, we found certain leading scientists and editors in the world of uh, publication colluding, contriving, conniving to do away with papers they didn't like the statements in. Uh, the great Phil Jones, a guy in England of great importance in those days, uh, wrote to some of his friends, we'll keep this out of the literature even if we have to redefine what the literature is. And as a result, we now know that the peer review process is badly corrupted. One of the easiest raps to make against a paper you don't like is it hasn't passed peer review. Well, with the barriers that are set up in that hidden way inside this contrivance, there are really good papers that are stopped by faulty and false peer review. In the particular case of William Hacker, he's a member, uh, not a member, he's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. In America, that's about the highest honor a guy can get. There may be 50 total fellows in the entire National Academy of Sciences. He's an eminent, eminent physicist. He doesn't have to take this crap from anybody. And what Happer did with these papers when he got badly treated en route to peer review was he posted them on the internet where everybody in the world is free to read them. There's a place called ARXIV, and now not only Happer, but a whole lot of papers in many fields, including the medical area, are showing up there rather than going through 
the rather badly corrupted peer review process. And I think it's to his credit that he's taken that first big step in standing up against what is really an unethical and illegal barrier to publication. Uh, that's, that's a really good answer to, that's exactly what I heard at lunchtime, so you haven't deviated, you're sticking to your <laughs> message. Secondly, I use the word debunk. Tell me what debunk means when you hear that word in terms of science and the what, what means? De de debunk. Debunk. Oh, debunk. Yeah. There are certain words that get you farther than they should. It's gotten out of fashion to call somebody a Nazi because <laughs> nobody pays attention to that anymore. But if you call them a climate denier, that's a cousin of calling them a Nazi because it sounds like Holocaust denier. And a lot of people take that as a serious statement. You can say your work has been debunked never offering any support, scientific support for that claim, and you hope the listener will say, oh, well, in that case, I won't bother, you know? And that's happening all the time. There are things you can say, slogans and keywords, that will fool the public into believing something that simply isn't true. And words like debunk, climate denier, etc., are very easily bandied about, but they aren't really true and shouldn't be paid attention to by anybody. Thank, thank you. And uh, just a reminder too, you may not have known that Jock Allison and Tom Sheehan wrote a paper in 2018, I think right. it was, that's been published and um, lauded. So, um, you know, at least you got through the machinery. Mm -hmm. Just to back up my claim I'm that... Um, I'm sorry, what? Uh, I just make a uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, talking about that paper we wrote in 2018, uh, one of my good friends uh, was thrown out by several people who said, Christ, has Alison gone mad? I mean, this is how deeply embedded we are. But just to add to the methane story, we are embedded with the um, supposed information that New Zealand has lots of methane, right? It doesn't. We have got somewhere between one six hundredth and one thousandth of the world's methane. It's hardly any at all. So James Shaw goes on about we would suffer reputational damage if we brought it up in some of these UN uh, negotiations. Nearly half of the methane, which goes into the atmosphere, is from natural sources. It bubbles out of the sea. They found some um, bubbling out of the East Coast North Island, the Hickorangan Trench, which is equal about half of the dairy cows in the country. It's bubbling out of the sea, right? We signed the methane pledge at the last COP meeting, this is the 40,000 people jamboree they have every year. Um, James Shaw wasn't even there, he got his dates cocked up. The methane, he thought the methane discussions were in the second week, they were in the first week, he didn't get into the second week, but it's an official sign. Right? Mm -hmm. So we didn't know about the methane thing. What we didn't know about the methane thing was, was that John Kerry, who, who, who uh, Tom tells me is a complete joke in America, they got more and more money going in to solve the methane problem. And if you add up all of the money, um, which the documentation that Jess Green has done, they're getting close to two billion US um, already there to research methane. Mm -hmm. this, this is a big train that's going. There are lots of people on it, and there are lots of people who want to stay on it at your expense. Mm -hmm. You've got to get up and do something. We are trivial. Methane is trivial, but we are totally trivial in the world in terms of all that methane. Let's get on and do something. Thanks, John. John Allison deserves a lot of acclamation for his tenacity in this space. But just last thing before I open it up, if you think William Hacker and William and Little Van Weingarten, they didn't get it published, doesn't matter. Yeah, we'll just kick that for touch as feds and be glad and dairy and 
done because we're in Slack and plus it looks like I'm going to go. I don't know. I couldn't say that. Could I? Um, they're in the tent. Here's, here's the paper by Co. Babinski and others of 2022, 20, 2021 actually, sorry. The impact of CO2, H2O, and other greenhouse gases on the equilibrium earth temperatures. Last sentence in this abstract. This strongly suggests that increasing levels of CO2 will not lead to significant changes in the earth temperature and that increases in CH4, CH4 and E2O will have very little discernible impact. So another paper published 2021. What are feeds going about? What's, what's beef and lamb going about? What are dairy and Z going about? So, questions. Got to wire, haven't I? <laughs> Who's first? Question? Yes, please go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm uh, David Meads. I'm running for council in this coming by election. Uh, my camp uh, question is why is it that our local farmers, the greenest in the world, are taxed a high heaven for alleged emissions, yet our Prime Minister can take two Boeing 737s to China uh, with no repercussions or questions from activists? the Greens or Greta Thunberg. I think that's probably out of fear I've told him he's not really here to talk about his own politics. But I can answer for you. I think you know our sentiments. It is, um, it is nonsense, of course. Okay, so let's try and... Well, we, we can be as political as you like, but um, I'd rather just stuck to the Tom's messages um, for the question to Tom, at least. Yeah, I can just say one thing about that. There's a general rule among scientists, don't go to another country and criticize your own government, but there's an absolute rule that says don't go to another country and criticize their government. That's completely out of bounds for me as an American scientist. But I'm glad to have Donda address it, or Jock address it, because they know what's going on. Um, my name is Ian Pottinger, um, City Councillor. This morning um, we had a WasteNet meeting. Now, WasteNet is a combined group of councillors from Gore, Southern District, and Chicago. And what we do is waste to landfill, we do recycling and stuff like that. Anyway, this morning we had a presentation online from the Ministry for the Environment on their policy to make everybody. Put a, collect their uh, kitchen waste, put it in a wheelie bin out front to be collected and taken away to some very expensive plant to make compost. Mm -hmm. And they said by doing this that we're going to save the planet. <laughs> now I worked it out that we would, Alice and I, between us, about a 27 litre bucket a month of this waste and we just to put it in our compost heap ourselves. But they are serious about the whole of New Zealand by the year 2030 having this compulsory collection for urban areas and even, uh, even rural as well. So their science that they gave us this morning is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. In that regard, there is a universal problem in schools everywhere that they don't teach scientific notation to children. And as a result, words like million, billion, trillion, etc. get all blended together and nobody knows the difference between 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 4th. Um, children ought to learn that because the big numbers associated with water vapor, the fairly big numbers associated with CO2, are orders of magnitude greater than the numbers associated with methane. And as that is forgotten, 
you will wind up getting again and again instructions about packaging up your little bit of garbage and putting it aside somewhere because you lose focus on the really big important things when your people, your leaders, your politicians don't understand big numbers. And it's a terrible problem. It's, I don't know how bad it is in New Zealand, but I know it's terrible in America and it's a failing of the elementary education system. But I can't fix it. Go ahead, please. Hi, Tom. Just Queen. You did speak briefly in passing about, you know, in the laboratory how they use the gas. They dry, they use dry air effectively. But these experiments that you were talking about, what effect do you think as a, because out here when we speak about greenhouse gases, we don't even seem to consider water vapor at all. In your opinion, how important is the role of water vapor in whatever the climate, whatever effect it has on climate with regards to the other ones in comparison to carbon dioxide or methane? How important is the effect of water vapor which we seem to be completely neglecting? It's 75% of the greenhouse effect. And Water vapor is dominant completely. And we, but we can't tax it, can we? And, and, but we can't seem to tax it, and that's where lies the problem, doesn't it? Probably so, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I think we had a hand up over here. rumours and seen a bit of the press about what happens or is happening in Holland. I'd imagine that you may know a fair bit about what's happening to the dairy farmers or maybe general farmers in Holland, particularly with the, the government regulations and farming and I, know, I guess basically an anti-farming government policy. I have read about that to a limited extent, but honestly my knowledge doesn't get any deeper than newspapers, the same ones you can read. But I do think that if a partnership were formed between Ireland, Netherlands, and New Zealand, in which you all said in unison, we may be small countries, but we count too, that you could stand up in unison against some of the crazy things coming out of Europe. Uh, net zero thing already, Germany, England, and Sweden have all bailed out of the net zero thing. And I would love to see Netherlands and Ireland do so too. And bring them on because the similarities of the farming economy of all three countries have remarkable uh, similarities. Oh, can you hear me down there? Hey, look, I'm Larry Patterson from Brownsville NZ. Um, I might be a wee bit hoarse because I spent a bit of time at um, Mr. Creek selling golf balls. <laughs> but look, uh, I went to uh, Tom's first presentation at uh, Hamilton Airport and what you've gone through tonight is pretty complex, eh? And uh, Tom presents it extremely well. But there was a guy there who many of you I know called Armand Jennings. And he looked at me and to see that I was obviously struggling and he said, look, why don't we put it into something that you can understand uh, simply that you're used to doing. So we like to do rugby, but we're rugby down after the weekend. And it was a forward pass, by the way. Uh, but um, he said, what about Bull Rush? So you guys have all played Bull Rush, or you should have when you were young. And the idea, of course, is to get from this side of the paddock to the other, and the whole school's against it. So I said, OK, the light comes down as UV, so don't lie on the beach too long and you'll get sunburned. But then, after it's been on the ground, it changes it infrared, right? And we all know what heat wants to do, it wants to go straight up to the stratosphere. So what's stopping it get there, getting there? <clears throat> so you're on the field and you're the little heat guy and you've got the whole paddock, you've got to get to the other end. So you've got methane at 1.8 parts per million, so that's 1.8 guys, right? One guy that's fit and the other one's 0.8, so that must mean he's got a sprained ankle or a short side or something. And uh, so he's the first one you've got to get past. And then you've got CO2 at 
400 parts of onion, so there's 400 of them. And then you've got H2O, which is water vapor, and we all know what water vapor does because we've seen it in the last few days, right? If the clouds are there, we don't have a frost, and if the clouds disappear, we have a hell of a frost. So H2O, there's 15,000 of them on the park. You can take all that into, um, into account. Which one do you think is going to attract the most heat? It's not going to be methane, is it? So, there you go, that's to simplify it. And I made it when Alan said that, I sort of got my head around it. Uh, there's another thing that we need to think about as well, and that is the fact that Barry Brewer put about the other day, he's done an OIA. And it's the fact that in the Ministry of Climate Change, we've got all these guys, uh, bureaucrats there, and they're giving advice, policy stuff to the Minister of Climate Change, their good mate James, and they're actually telling him, hey look, we know that in the IPCC report AR6, it says that methane is overstated by four times. But, you know, gee, uh, we don't really want to say anything about that because um, we might have reputational damage. If you think about that, that's a hell of a thing for the farmers of New Zealand, eh? We know it's wrong, but we're not going to say nothing about it. I don't know about you guys, but I was told that if you didn't tell the truth when you were young, you sure as hell got your ass kicked. Um, and that's what they need. So we need to uh, stand up, I think, against all this nonsense, and you guys are the key people in it at the bottom. And I'll just leave you with, uh, you know, we're scared of uh, reputational damage. I'll just leave you with a little quote. And it is, fear is the reaction. Courage is the decision. Yeah, Jack uh, Allison brings up a very important point that I should have mentioned. Nitrous oxide is about one-third of a part per million as compared to the whopping big methane at 1.8 parts per million. So methane is like six times as important as nitrous oxide. Van Weygarten Happer also did the same calculation for that particular gas. If you can remember that close-up of the methane case, the nitrous oxide one looks even harder to see because both green line and red line are a whole lot closer to the black line. But that is what actually shows up when you're dealing with nitrous oxide. So to the extent that people come along and say, oh, my heavens, nitrates, da-da-da, whatever, to confuse nitrates, which is a pollutant that gets into the water, with nitrous oxide, is a very fundamental mistake in chemistry. Don't let anybody push you in that direction, okay? Nitrous oxide is an incredibly tiny minor gas, and the calculations are there to show it. Don, here's again. Um, can you hear me then? Yeah. Um, what science is behind, and what are the numbers behind, like, I was taking my boy over to play broke me into a tap room the other day and there was a whole farm one planted in trees. Do you know what sort of signs they're using to uh, have carbon credits and offset money here and there to be planting our farmland in trees, on trees? And do you want a job at the local school? <laughs> Honestly, the question that you basically says is, do you know? My answer is no. There's stuff going on out there that is incomprehensible to me, and I just haven't got the time to dig into everything in great detail. So I have to duck your question because I just don't know. There's plenty of people that do. <laughs> Put on all the dust. Right, for the, for the pine trees. Now, 
it is political science, I'd say there's no other science there. It is as, as simple as that. The, the numbers don't add up, the money sure does. And at any given point, I, I live in Tojabri, I'm a, also a Southern District Councillor, and around us, the entire place is going up in pines. We are right now surrounded where we are farming by pine trees on three sides. And last weekend, I had a, in the evening, I had the two property dealers drive up to our place telling us another farm is going up and do you want to, you know, we just work on the farm, we contract one because they want to swap the bushy block with some of their flats. So it's, it's literally going up, but the money is really good. No one else can come close. As John would confirm, we've created in New Zealand an artificial carbon market, which is currently trading at something like, I think it's fallen now in recent times, but it was at one time trading at four to five times that of our closest trading partners. You know, to put it simply, money is literally growing on trees in New Zealand. There is no other science besides political science behind it. Yeah, we're going to have, um, have pine tree soup. <laughs> but believe it or not, I heard the other day, I heard the other day that um, I looked at pellet uh, making for energy production, so wood pellets. They're not going to use the trash and the slash and the waste that's left behind. They want the best logs for that. Yeah. It's really odd, but that's where we are. John Allison would be far better if you qualified to answer that question than me. But when you plant your good land in pine trees, it makes the ground acidic. Releases the poisons to the ground, they wash into your rivers and washes out to sea, and changes the whole bloody account. The ecology of the system, these greeny bastards aren't interested, they are prostitutes, and they don't serve the system because it destroys them. <coughs>
and it's never recognised. And the other day, I learned that one of our prime trade negotiators, who was my junior when I was in Wellington, is now part of the World Economic Forum trade discussions. What's that person's name? I don't need to talk about it just publicly, but you can go and search it for yourself. Um, and so we've got unelected people in the United Nations, unelected people in the uh, WEF, and we've got people trying to sell us down the gurgler with a methane tax, and we've got farmers saying, farmer organisations saying a little bit of tax is okay. Um, do they not understand that would be world first humanity to say that uh, a sector is willing to have a tax applied to itself? It's never been done anywhere on the planet. So, what are you going to do about it? Laurie's got some answers. What are the rest of you thinking? We feel Ponder like, a we, 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 some feel like we feel like we're selling the fact that the world is flat. It's that bigger challenge. It's it's uh, it's <coughs> you know in everyday life you just you, you're treated like somebody different because you have these different views, which we know uh, you know truths. But I mean we really are under the pump in every walk of life. Well, but before Tom perhaps answers that, you mentioned before we've got two hundred million dollars worth of expenses already in the pastoral greenhouse gas consortium all the all those regimes around it. The empire building by those entities encouraged by Beaver Land, Dairy and Z and perhaps Federated Farmers and others. <coughs> Um, I think, at least in America, the weaponization of climate change has become recognized by the wider public. It should be a scientific controversy. That's where this belongs as a topic. But it has been turned into a political football for many years now, and the Biden administration has weaponized it and made it a very clear divide between Democrats and Republicans and that's going to show up in our next election in 2024. But when the people recognize the weaponization of a topic, they tend to ignore or dismiss it. And we are seeing more and more Americans who regard the phrase climate change as a joke. Um, why did your girlfriend break up with you? Climate change. <laughs> I mean, that's, it has become a joke. You know, it's a punchline. And um, that shows that the public is turning away from uh, fear, from believing weaponization. And I think that it is going to be costly to the politicians who continue to cling to weaponizing climate change. Now, there was a bill passed in the American Congress not long ago called Inflation Reduction Act which an incredible spending bill, $500 billion for things. It's all kinds of uh, what we call Christmas tree decorations of goodie, goodies given away to one or another interest group. That's going to get the attention of the people. And I believe it will rebound to the uh, negative side of those who are pushing it, as climate change is a weaponized thing. 
Does this convert linearly to New Zealand? I don't know. But at least the analog of America is something probably people can learn from. And I hope that my fellow Americans are going to learn from what's going on over in Europe, where a great fanfare of great excitement of net zero program a few years ago has now dying in shambles. When Germany walks out on something like that, followed by Britain, followed by Sweden, probably another eight or nine European countries are going to cascade and ditch net zero. And the whole thing's going to go down the drain. It'll be a huge embarrassment. And a fair percentage of us in America are going to sit there chuckling about it and hoping that our own government will learn the lesson on, instead of going down the drain following it. Now, what's going to happen on this side of the world, I can't say. But I think if you folks, as farmers, with strength in your convictions, go to your legislators and insist that they pay attention to real science, maybe you will get somebody, um, get, some, get some results. Um, I can't promise it. I know that in America what the farmers do is, in the wintertime each year, which in our case is, is February, um, they'll get their tractors and somehow get them to Washington, D.C., and then drive around in a circle around the Capitol from wreck the place. And some people in Congress say, how can we get rid of these guys? The answer is, believe them, listen to them, do what they say. So large numbers of farmers demonstrating in this rather obnoxious way, wiping out traffic in Washington, does get the job done, okay? And I know I've gone to uh, city councils and other uh, local government meetings. And when I talk as a superstar expert, they thank me politely, bang the gavel and go to the next witness and forget the whole thing. But the one time I showed up with 300 people behind me, we got results. And that is something that is very important in American politics. And maybe it's important in New Zealand politics too. Maybe. I don't know. Yes. Uh, the question was asked before why uh, I think, uh, people in government don't um, look at the data and aren't really interested. And, and none of your negotiators on the world stage are interested um, in any of this stuff. Uh, government policy worldwide is climate change caused by humans. The government uh, pay all the people in the public service, they pay all the people in the universities, they pay all the teachers. We've had three decades now of uh, training kids in climate change, uh, and thus we've got to, uh, we're terrorising our children, uh, which is actually the case. If you're in a government job and you say you disagree with this stuff, your peers uh, ostracise you and you eventually lose your job. That's a meal tank. Um, the numbers that Don uh, and Jasper are talking about, 200 million already spent in the Greenhouse Gas Consortium, that's a big number, but it is a very small number in the overall scheme. The government is putting in another 350 million to develop some of the technologies which are looking good and uh, <coughs> developed over the last 20 years. Within the next four years, unspendable. We haven't got technologies that can be developed. Right? So, and there's another 150 from industry to go in there. So it's not going to happen. It's highly political. Did you all know that all of you you didn't know, did you? $30 billion is the cost to stop oil and gas exploration in Taranaki. And that's $6,000 for every New Zealander. It will achieve nothing. That's a cost from the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, a big report. This is what's going on under your very eyes. The only way through this is political, it really isn't about the science. But doing anything you would, of course, like it to be science based. You actually have to do it. I've met the only people when I speak to groups of farm going back four and five years. You have to protest, you have to be together. Some of you may have to go to jail, but we've got to turn it around. You see, it's quite simple. Nobody likes their standard of living being diminished. 
And when they wanted to punish it to half or going back to cave men, you know, get into it. And there's no, no time like now. Stock, this way, no? the warming from New Zealand livestock from 1850 to 2100. And it goes up like this, and he said, Do you see, you're causing warming, and therefore you should pay. I looked at the y-axis, and the total warming that he had on his graph was of a degree over 250 years from New Zealand livestock. 1.8 thousandths of a degree. Now, if you take the slope of his graph from 2000 to 2100, it was 0.4 thousandths of a degree, which translates to 4 millionths of a degree per year. Now, there was a day in November last year, in the morning it was 8 degrees, and in the afternoon it was 28 degrees. I don't know how we can measure 4 millionths of a degree. It is absolutely absurd that anyone should be paying a tax for four millionths of a degree. It is unmeasurable, it is you know, uh, inconsequential, it is irrelevant. Now the second thing was that I wrote, uh, prior to Tom's visit, I wrote to all members of the Beef and Lamb, uh, all the directors, saying, you know, this is what Tom's about, and all members should attempt to see, go to one of his lectures, or to meet with him. And I got a reply back from Kate Ackland, who's the chairman of Beef and Lamb, and she was clearly just cut and pasted a reply to someone else, because I never asked about funding for Tom. The first thing she said was that, well, it's not in the consensus science, and, and if the if the scientists that accept this research and change this consensus changes, then beef and lamb might change. Now, and pigs might fly. Because the, the re reality is, uh, you know, I've spent three quarters of an hour talking to Harry Clark, who runs the Greenhouse Research Centre, trying to convince him. Anyway, he, he has had $200 million. He's getting a $340 million building provided uh, he is not going to, because if, if this research is accepted, he will be out of a job. There's no point in doing that work if methane does nothing. He is not going to be the dirty that holds his hand up and votes for Thanksgiving or Christmas, is he? And that's the thing, you've got this huge fund of, pool of money which is used by the scientists, and as long as they've got them snouts in the trough, they're not going to adopt a paper, or accept a paper, which says you're out of a job, mate. Okay, now the second thing that Kate said was that Dr. Sheehan had not met the threshold of, uh, what was the word she used? Um, credibility. The threshold of credibility for Beef and Lamb taking notice. And then she went on and said it would not be for Beef and Lamb to be seen to be uh, supporting a climate denier. Yeah. That's what she called, that's what she inferred. Very, very clearly. Oh, I've got the actual writing here, but I can't think of the other one. So this is from your representative organisation. And I said, but she's not going to resign without pressure from you guys. And she needs to resign. I think half of Beef and Lamb executive need to resign as well. But they're not going to do it without considerable pressure from farmers around the country. We've been poorly, poorly dead, very poorly dead, and it's time to Oh, sorry. Um, one time I was a scientist, then I became a teacher, and for the last 15 years I've been researching uh, climate uh, science, that is in the peer-reviewed literature, on a sort of daily basis, and along with Jock, I'm a member of the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, and we've had numerous talks with Tom over the years, and other 
really top scientists around the world uh, who keep us up to date with the with the science and, and what the real story is. So anyway, that's, uh, that's me. Oh, apart from that, I, uh, I've got a small deer, deer farm, deer and cattle farm uh, in the north of Dunedin. Thank, thank you for that. Any last questions? Oh, Owen. Oh, I can't believe he hadn't asked one before now. Uh, this is a more of a question for you, Don. What would it take to call a special meeting for Beacon Lane to give them a surprise that basically sat the ones that are not willing to listen? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if they're not listening. Second person to ask me that today, and I really don't know the answer. Um, I'm sure there will be something in the Constitution of the Commodity Levies Act, as to, oh, sorry, in the legislation of the Commodity Levies Act, that can give you a.
done with what the state were in. So um, on behalf of everyone here, if you show a uh, Well, thanks to all of you. I, uh, while I've been here for several days, I have learned a lot and are things you should be bragging about because good farming, which is energy efficient, doesn't waste.